photos. Yes. Um, okay, so I think because we have a, sh a relatively short amount of time for this panel and folks have logged on, let's go on, go ahead and get started. Probably have a few latecomers. Um, so welcome all to the Verge Electrify policy panel. Uh, my name is Sarah Baldwin. I am the Director of Electrification Policy with Energy Innovation. Uh, energy Innovation is a clean energy policy think tank. Uh, we support uh, analysis to help policymakers make sound decisions around climate and energy policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I am honored to moderate this panel today with a, an esteemed group of experts on the topic of policy. And of course, for those who are in policy, we know there's a, a wide range of topics to cover. We could take an entire three-day conference to touch on all the intricacies of electric, electrification policy and the regulatory aspects of electrification in buildings, transportation, and industry. But in the hour that we have today, or 45 minutes, uh, we're gonna do our best to give a higher level overview of uh, some of the, the key trends and themes on in the policy front uh, from the kind of federal standpoint, state standpoint, and touching on local activities as well. Uh, knowing this is a diverse audience and we have a lot of folks who may be uh, some deep in the weeds on policy and others newer to the space, uh, we'll endeavor to you know, touch on things that can relate to both ends of the spectrum. Um, and we will try and get to as many of your questions at the end. Um, so the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna uh, have Vincent Barnes and Rachel Golden and then John Wellinghoff, three slides each approximately, and, and then we'll transition to Q&A. Um, because of the technical setup here, I'm unable to see clarifying questions if they come in. So I would invite our panelists, if you see clarifying questions pop up uh, that need to be answered in order to clarify what's being presented, please do. Otherwise, we'll just touch on it at the end to the extent we're able to um, and or follow up with you guys after. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to kick us off uh, having Vincent Barnes, who's the Senior Vice President of Policy and Research with the Alliance to Save Energy, uh, lead us in a uh, quick overview happening in the energy efficiency space, which is directly connected to and very interrelated with electrification. Then uh, Rachel Golden, who is the director of the Clean Buildings Campaign with Sierra Club. Uh, she'll focus on what the uh, states and local governments are doing as it relates to building electrification and some federal activities as well. And then finally, John Wellinghoff, CEO of Grid Policy and former FERC commissioner, uh, will talk about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, what's happening there, how that intersects with electrification activities, and what you should be keeping your eye on as FERC that we have in place uh, undertakes many activities in the years to come. So with that, I'm going to share my slides or share my screen here and kick us off with Vincent. And just a reminder, Vincent, uh, I will do my best to, to follow your lead, but please do cue me with a uh, slide so I know when to advance and go ahead and take it away. And I can't hear you if you're talking, so you may need to unmute. I've been doing this for over a year. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know. <laughs> Sarah, go ahead and advance to the, uh, to the, to the first actual slide, but um, thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here today as part of Verge Electrify, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share um, where things are from a policy perspective on energy efficiency. Um, the, the Alliance to Save Energy is the preeminent policy and research organization leading on issues um, of energy efficiency, founded in 1977 in response to what was then an energy crisis. Um, the Alliance is again taking the, taking the lead as we confront today's energy challenge, and that is climate change. So why are we here? Um, why have we all gathered for this discussion? Um, we're here because of a joint common interest, um, really, that is in avoiding a climate disaster through substantive reductions 
um, and carbon emissions. Um, certainly, while there are a number of tools in the climate mitigation toolbox and a number of tools in development, um, there is limited time available to really achieve substantive carbon reductions necessary. Uh, next slide. Um, with that in mind, uh, energy efficiency is the single most effective tool with the potential of achieving needed carbon reductions today. And in fact, based on a recent study, um, through energy efficiency alone, we have the ability to literally reduce U.S. carbon emissions by 50% by 2050. And this could be done at a lower cost than many other climate mitigation efforts and has the added benefit of lowering energy costs for consumers, lowering energy costs for industry, and lowering energy costs for small businesses. Energy efficiency isn't about turning off the lights when you leave the room or setting your thermostat at 65 degrees, um, a shout out to um, the 1970s, although conservation is always an important tool. Um, instead, as an example, energy efficiency is using um, lighting that burns efficiently and heating and cooling our homes with equipment designed to use less energy while also losing less energy. For example, in 2017, the U.S. marked an important stage um, in energy efficient lighting, um, recording actually 1 billion LEDs and CFLs installed. This also marked the avoidance of 142 million tons uh, a year of carbon emissions at a cost of $7 per ton of avoided emissions. Now, in comparison, th though not to demonstrate one choice above another, but as a demonstration of the low cost and effectiveness of a tool in our arsenal, and that's energy efficiency. Um, in 2017, rooftop solar reached 8,000 megawatts, saving 8 million tons a year in emissions. And the cost there was $360 per ton. This means that lighting efficiency achieved 18 times the avoided emissions at 2% of the cost. Heat pumps are another example in, in, energy, in the energy efficiency arsenal with major carbon reduction benefits, both in larger commercial buildings and in the residential sector as well. In fact, by some estimates, heat pumps can actually cut carbon emissions by half. And when installed in large factories, we have seen reductions in energy, in energy use up to 80% and a 90% reduction in emissions. Uh, next slide. As we translate the benefits of energy efficiency into policy, we are focused on several priorities at the Alliance. First is using the tax code to incentivize energy efficiency adoption by consumers, uh, developers, and commercial building owners. Through the tax code alone, based on an analysis of supported provisions, we actually have the ability to avoid 341 million metric tons of carbon emissions and achieve an energy cost savings exceeding $53 billion. That said, at the Alliance, we're also seeking to expand the effectiveness of, of the Energy Star program by doubling the Energy Star budget. We're, we're all familiar with the name Energy Star, certainly have seen the yellow tags on, um, on, on, on various appliances, but few of us know that the Energy Star budget is a mere $40 million annually. Um, that said, few of us know that at, that at such a low annual appropriations, that since 1992, Energy Star has achieved $4 billion metric tons of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions reductions and has saved 5 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity and avoided more than $450 billion in energy costs. Additionally, the Alliance is prioritizing small business energy efficiency adoption as well. Um, energy costs are the third largest operating cost for small businesses and to help relieve this burden and incentivize adoption of energy efficiency products and equipment um, the Alliance to Save Energy has developed the Main Street Efficiency Act. Now, this legislation would actually provide funding through the Department of Energy uh, to match capital provided through the demand side management programs of various utilities, significantly reducing or eliminating the costs necessary for small business owners to employ full energy efficiency retrofits. This legislation will soon be introduced by Senator uh, Catherine Cortez Masto in the Senate and Congressman Peter Welch in the House. So as a brief note, I will add that uh, we are also working with a number of Republican offices in an attempt to achieve a bipartisan bill introduction. That said, over the three-year life of the program, we project 40 million metric tons of, of avoided carbon emissions and $6.2 billion in energy cost savings. Um, there are also two existing legislative measures, that is, measures that have been introduced by other members um, that are already um, out there um, that we have identified as our priorities. And that is the Open Back Better Act, led by Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester and, um, and Senator uh, Tina Smith. 
and also the Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Act led by Chairman uh, Bobby Rush, my old boss. Um, additionally, the alliance is at the forefront of the transportation discussion with many others, um, particularly focused on increased funding um, in support of technology development, electric vehicle development, and deployment of needed EV charging infrastructure sufficient to meet the needs of rural and urban parts of the country. And, and, and then, of course, the Alliance continues to prioritize funding for state energy programs and the weatherization assistance program as well. Of note, um, demand for WAP far outstrips available funding, no news there. And while we support $10 billion over 10 years, we also recommend gradual increases over time to match demand levels. Having said that, the Alliance recognizes that, if, that really if we are to achieve energy efficiency adoption at all income levels, we, we certainly must be able to effectively retrofit homes owned by low-income families. Again, we must be able to effectively retrofit homes that are owned by low-income families. With that in mind, based on research that we are currently conducting at the Alliance, we are learning that the total number of low-income owner-occupied homes, that is, incomes below 60,000, based on our numbers and for our purposes here, that number nearly matches the total number of non-low-income owner-occupied that is 60,000 and above. So that kind of gives us a sense that there's a great deal of work to do in the low-income owner-occupied space. And so we're focused there as well. Uh, finally, as a priority, um, the Alliance is leading on active efficiency. As a general rule, often when we think about energy efficiency, what comes to mind is, is static efficiency as we know it. And what I mean by that is, is, is the physical equipment itself, a furnace, an air conditioner, um, an, ener an energy efficiency uh, refrigerator, et cetera. Um, that said, technology is already moving us um, to the future of energy efficiency, which is actually active efficiency. Active efficiency is actually the optimization of energy efficiency and includes the utilization of DER-enabled devices in the home with the ability, to, with the ability I should say, uh, to communicate with the consumer, manufacturers, utilities, and the grid with devices, equipment, and appliances, including electric vehicles, um, taking, sharing, and shedding load. This really is the future of energy, um, which is the future of energy efficiency. Curiously, as a component to active efficiency that is not talked about much in the energy, in the energy industry in general is broadband access. However, the future of energy is connected energy, and for connected energy to occur, we must be able to ensure high-speed broadband access. That, that said, um, and as you can see last on the slide, there is equity. And equity is at the bottom, not because it's the least important, but because it is the foundation of our work at the Alliance. And this includes ensuring that energy efficiency tax provisions and other incentives are rightly tuned for all income levels, that federal programs are sufficiently funded to ensure energy efficiency adoption by all, what we call energy efficiency universal access, and that EV accessibility goes beyond vehicle affordability, affordability and includes equitable EV charging infrastructure access in high density urban communities, in addition to sparsely populated rural areas. This also means solving for inequities in broadband access in rural and urban communities as well to ensure that the benefits of energy efficiency are experienced by all with the understanding that is, if we are to achieve and retain the carbon reductions necessary we must also solve for the broadband issue. That said, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's panel and I look forward to our discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Vincent. Really helpful and very concise overview of the multifold priorities and activities uh, that you guys are working on. I think in the interest of time, I, have, I do have questions, but I'm gonna proceed to Rachel Golden and uh, have her highlight the work underway at the Sierra Club to electrify buildings and some of the activities underway uh, in the States. So Rachel. Great, care. thank you. Thanks so much. So I direct Sierra Club's Clean Buildings Campaign. Uh, Sierra Club is one of the largest uh, grassroots based environmental organizations in the US. Um, we advocate at the state, city and the federal level. So really happy to be here today with all of you. And thank you, Vincent, for that really excellent overview and all of your work with um, ASC. Um, so first, when we talk about electrification at the state and city level, we always get the same question first. And so I want to address this head on. Um, we hear people say, okay, electrification is great. It's great for California. It's great for Washington, for New York, states with very clean grids. But is this really going to work nationwide? 
And so we did the analysis and the answer is yes. In fact, electrification will cut greenhouse gas emissions in every corner of the country, in every house across the US using today's grid. Um, so if you click ahead, Sarah, to the first, uh, maybe if you go two clicks, um, we did the analysis basically showing that installing a heat pump today to replace your gas furnace and gas water heater is going to reduce emissions over the next 10 years of that appliance's life. And on average, the average house in the U.S. will reduce heating emissions, similar to what Vincent said, by roughly 45 percent over the next decade. And that's significant. So if you click again, that's basically equivalent to cutting a gasoline's car's pollution, carbon pollution by more than half. So the greenhouse gas emission savings from electrification is massive. It's an untapped resource of GHG savings. And all told, once you factor in not just the emission savings, but also the emission savings from methane leakage, it's about a gigaton of greenhouse gas emissions annually that we're able to reduce from the atmosphere. Um, so it's a really big opportunity and it's critical, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level as well, to be driving forward policies that are gonna get fossil fuels out of our homes and buildings. So I'm gonna focus mostly on the state and the, and the city opportunities. And go to the next slide, please. So first let's talk about some policy solutions for utilities and, and state level decision makers. If you click ahead. Um, so the first problem that we're seeing is that the gas system is rapidly expanding. The American Gas Association <laughs> likes, to um, likes to show that they're actually connecting roughly 550,000 new homes to gas every year. That's one new house is getting connected to gas every minute of the year. Um, so the solution here is we obviously need to stop the expansion of gas. We need to stop the system from growing and we need to start to shrink it. And there's several policy lever levers that decision makers can be using at the state level to do this. Um, primary one is building codes. Uh, states can adopt all electric building codes, super efficient building codes, codes that encourage all electric new construction. So this is really critical. And this is one of the easiest, the most cost effective paths um, to getting to the zero carbon building sector is to start with new construction. Another thing that we're finding is that in nearly every state in the country, utilities are actually getting subsidized to extend their gas lines to new buildings. Um, these are called gas line extension allowances. And these are largely regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. So public utilities commissioners can scale back these subsidies to gas, util to gas utilities and stop subsidizing the expansion of these pipelines. And then the third part and the third policy lever is around gas planning. So when uh, gas utilities want to replace or expand um, their infrastructure, they go through proceedings at public utilities commissions. This is a key place for commissioners and decision makers to call for an examination of alternatives <coughs> and what are some cost effective and climate aligned alternatives to replacing and expanding the pipe system. Uh, so this is already happening in New York and in several other states. Let's, so let's go to the next area part for policy solutions. You click ahead. So another problem that we're seeing is that um, gas receives roughly $1.5 billion of subsidies annually. So this $1.5 billion is from AC looking at um, gas energy efficiency programs. The solution here is that we need to start divesting from subsidizing gas and start investing in clean energy and electrification. Um, so there's several policy levers to do this. Um, we can wind down gas subsidies through our public utility commission proceedings. And as we do that, we need to start investing more in clean energy. So rebates and incentives for heat pumps, for induction stoves, and for panel upgrades. And panel upgrades is critical because that can really be the costly area and the barrier to electrification. Another way of making electrification affordable is rate reform. So electrification, a um, new study that's coming out next week from Rewiring America shows that electrification is already going to be affordable to 56 million households across the U.S. in terms of the energy bills. And they, these households will see reductions in their energy bills from electrification. But there's still several states that need to undergo rate reform to make sure that all households see lower bills from electrification. And that takes place in rate dockets at public utilities commissions. Um, so it's really vital that we start to align our rates and our rate structures with our climate plans. So we're actually incentivizing people to do the right thing and to go to a zero emissions home. And then uh, that last part I wanna to touch on, if you can click ahead, is how this impa impacts um, low-income households. So roughly a third of the country 
are low income, right? And these households face significant barriers to clean energy and are also facing a lot of challenges just paying their energy bills as it is. So we need a dedicated stream of funding to help low income folks electrify. And it's not enough to just swap in the heat pump for a gas appliance. A lot of these homes, roughly one twelfth of these homes actually need major repairs. So we're talking about a whole home, comprehensive home retrofit, or we're looking at health and safety upgrades as well. Um, so this is really critical. So some policy levers to do this, and obviously this can be a tremendous amount of funding coming from the federal level through the American Jobs Plan, through the infrastructure plan to the states. And so that we need to make sure that's successful. That is a huge priority. But at the state level, there's also a lot that states can be doing right away. Um, so one is, you know, having all utilities create electrification pilot programs that are doing energy efficiency, that are doing weatherization, and that are also making homes electrification ready or electrifying them at the get-go. Um, it's really important that we have a comprehensive approach here and planning for low-income homes. This is not just an energy issue, this is a health issue as well and a safety issue. So all the appropriate state agencies need to be involved in this and community groups need to be involved and funded to be at the table having these conversations. It's not going to work if the um, communities that we're trying to serve don't understand what transition is going on and are not involved in the decision making process. So this really needs to be a really comprehensive approach with the planning. And then the last thing is that as we start to you know, upgrade and weatherize and electrify low income homes and buildings, there needs to be protections in place to make sure that rent is not going up if it, in a low income multifamily apartment, that people aren't getting displaced and that their energy bills are not going up. So we also need some safeguards and safe rails, protections in place in all of these policies for low income homes and households. So these are just three of the buckets of some of the policy solutions that we're recommending at the state level. And I do wanna um, share some great news that's happening at the city level as well on the next slide. So there's been an amazing amount of progress happening across the US in the last couple of years at the city level. And it's been incredibly exciting to see this. Um, the chart on the left shows all the cities just in California that have adopted a zero emission buildings code. This is basically a local code that either requires or strongly encourages all electric new construction for residential and commercial buildings. And since um, 2019, We've seen roughly, four, we've seen 45 cities. Today, the 45th city is gonna adopt the code, South, Southern San Francisco. Um, 45 cities adopt these electrification codes. It's been really incredible to see month after month, cities stepping forward and saying, we don't wanna expand gas, we want all electric, and we need to do this for our climate, for our climate goals. So at the city level, buildings make up roughly 80, um, or roughly the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. So we're seeing many, many cities start to move towards a zero carbon building sector and getting rid of gas appliances. This is not just happening in California, this is happening across the US. And the three buckets of policies <laughs> that we're seeing cities move in is both the building codes, so Seattle, Denver, New York, Washington DC, Burlington, Brookline, Boston, other surrounding towns, they're all looking to do these electrification building codes this year. It's incredibly exciting. We're also seeing cities integrate electrification into their climate action plans, which is incredibly important. That basically sends the signal to city staff that they need to start to developing the programs and the policies around electrification to achieve the city's climate goals. And then the third area is around emission standards. So this is basically how we can start to get existing buildings to get off of fossil fuels and to head towards a zero carbon future. So emission standards, um, New York City, Washington DC, Boston is looking at doing this. It basically sets an emissions cap for very large buildings. So we're not talking about single family buildings, we're talking about large commercial, multifamily buildings and, com and commercial buildings. It sets a cap for their emissions that will ratchet down with time. It often um, it is accompanied by financing to help landlords and building owners electrify and reduce emissions. And then there's often a penalty if the building owner doesn't um, meet the emission standards mm -hmm. reductions. So these are three buckets of work that we're seeing cities lead on um, and cities make um, start to work on this year as well. And my last slide, I um, just wanna share that the momentum, as I said, is really building and it's really exciting. So over 45 cities have adopted building codes. We see nearly a dozen states across the country are including building electrification in their climate and energy planning. 
And recently, the Biden-Harris administration has called for electrification of over a million homes and schools. And they've also called for the end of fossil fuel subsidies, as well as investment in low-income communities. So it's tremendously exciting to see this progress happening from the state to the federal level. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I, I'll note that you have some appendix slides, which uh, we don't have time to go through, but they will be included in the um, available slides for, I believe, download or access for those registered attendees. Um, so as I expected, this time is going very quickly. So in the interest of getting to uh, hear from John and having some time for discussion after, I'm going to switch to John Wellinghoff uh, and have him talk about uh, what's happening at FERC, what's happening at the federal level in terms of regulatory activities. And uh, with that, John, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be with everybody today. And I really want to thank uh, Vincent and Rachel for their presentations because they've set me up so well here, uh, which <laughs> is which is nice. Um, I mean, the, the overarching goal that we're all trying to uh, move towards is is a zero carbon future, is decarbonization. And I want to weave together the things that Vincent said with respect to uh, both passive efficiency and actually Vincent, I'd never heard the term active efficiency before. I, I think I'm more used to the term demand response, but I like active efficiency much better. That's a wonderful uh, uh, terminology uh, to utilize. Weaving that together with what Rachel's saying about <clears throat> electrification, we actually, we absolutely have to electrify all of these fossil fuel uses that we have behind the meter <clears throat> that are uh, loads are using uh, heating and cooling or and water heating, uh, heating, uh, cooking, other other uses as well. <laughs> Ultimately, we have to go to electrification. And I think we can do that efficiently using uh, more efficient appliances and, and using active efficiency to help us as well. But uh, none of this really comes together and none of it will get to us the goal that the Biden administration has set of decarbonizing the grid by 2035 unless we take this next step. And the next step that I'm gonna talk about with respect to policy relates to uh, ultimately how we can make markets work at the federal level, uh, wholesale energy markets work to integrate all these things together. So if you give me my next slide, please, Sarah. So what I'm gonna to try to do is hopefully give you uh, quickly here, cause this could go on for <laughs> a long time, a little FERC 101, and then we'll go, and then we'll deep dive uh, into, into my second slide with respect to uh, how this weaves together on the consumer side. Uh, advance one, please, Sarah. So if we look at the U.S. overall, um, just with respect to resources, I think it was important to bring up this slide. <clears throat> um, the red dots um, represent our load centers where uh, major loads are used throughout the country, primarily on the East Coast and the West Coast. The yellow portions of our of the country here show where we have vast amounts of solar energy resources. The blue is is wind energy. The the green is the intersection of both wind and solar together. These are the areas that we're going to have to um, develop significantly with new uh, resources beyond what we already have, if we're going to decarbonize, move away from fossil fuels in the gray areas and move to renewable energy uh, throughout the system, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a real challenge for us to, to ultimately get there. Um, and this is the landscape that we have to look at with respect to resources overall. The dotted lines that you see in the middle of the country, and we'll start to get into FERC here, uh, separate three different interconnects, three different areas of transmission interconnection. There's one on the western interconnect on the western side of the Rockies, uh, all the way to California. There's another interconnect on the eastern side that goes all the way to the Atlantic. And then there is one in Texas. Texas, interestingly enough, is um, not strongly interconnected into the rest of the United States, and therefore uh, it's separate uh, both um, electrically and also separate from a, a policy and jurisdictional perspective. FERC does not have jurisdiction uh, over the markets in Texas, although it does have some responsibility for reliability issues 
in Texas regarding electricity. If you could advance one more, please, Sarah. So this shows you then the transmission overlay of all the high voltage transmission lines. And this is where <coughs> FERC's jurisdiction comes into play. FERC is responsible under the Federal Power Act, which was initiated in 1935, for all of the high voltage electric transmission systems in the US, with the exception of Texas, as I mentioned. And with respect to that transmission system, it is responsible for the planning, the cost allocation, and the oversight of the operation of those transmission systems. It's also responsible beyond those transmission systems for what are wholesale electric markets. If you could advance one more, please, Sarah. And this gives you an overview of the wholesale electric markets in the United States. Currently, there are <clears throat> six markets that FERC is responsible for, California, CAISO, California Independent System Operator, SBP, MISO, PGM, the New York ISO, and the New England ISO. Those are the six that FERC has responsibility for overseeing market operations, ensuring that those markets are fair, open, transparent. Uh, it also enforces uh, any uh, issues with respect to fraud and manipulation of those markets um, and ensures that those markets uh, operate in a way that uh, the dispatch of resources, renewable resources and what fossil fuel resources are there are dispatched in a, in a economic manner um, and in a manner that ensures that it delivers the lowest cost, most reliable energy to consumers. You'll notice, uh, and I mentioned ERCOT, which is outside of FERC uh, in that portion of Texas in the blue, that's under the jurisdiction of the State Public Utilities Commission in Texas. Um, and uh, they determine the market rules, they determine uh, the rules for interconnection uh, operation and uh, cost allocation and planning for transmission in Texas. Um, you'll also notice that there's two areas of the country, the Northwest and, and Southwest, actually two big areas, Northwest and Southwest, generally the Western United States, except for, Ca for California, and then the whole Southeast. Those areas currently do not have organized markets that are independently run. Um, and that is because basically uh, it was decided back in the early 2000s that the markets that would be created would be created voluntarily. I expect that to change in the next year or two. There's a bill in Congress right now that would require markets be, uh, independent markets be put everywhere. The reason why independent markets are better is because ultimately there's more competition. You can ensure that the lowest cost resources, which are generally renewable resources, so we're win, uh, are treated fairly for interconnection and uh, integration into those markets. Um, so I believe that either uh, Congress or FERC, and I think FERC has the power actually without Congress, uh, could uh, within the very near term, within a year or two, institute markets over the, the entire United States. Um, and so I think, I think that will um, ultimately uh, ensure that we have independently run wholesale markets that I think are essential for decarbonization of our grid in the period that we need to do it. But if we're going to do that, we need to have, as I mentioned, vast amounts of renewables integrated in the system beyond what we have now. And to do that, we need to ensure that we can manage the grid in a reliable fashion, cost effectively, and ensure that that grid can operate uh, you know, 24 seven. Um, and obviously renewables are variable we have to look at the variances between uh, sun in different parts of the country, uh, wind when it's blowing, offshore wind has different capacity factors than onshore wind. Uh, all these things are gonna play into how this whole system will integrate together. Well, the part that I haven't talked about yet, but the part that is really integral to what Vincent and, and, and to what Rachel have said are the consumer <coughs> side of resources what they call DERs, Distributed Energy Resources. Sarah, if you could advance uh, to the next slide, please. So if we talk about distributed energy resources, I'm gonna talk about an order 
a FERC order of 2222 and the federal trends with respect to the uh, distributed energy resources, if we could uh, advance one more. So basically, this diagram gives you pretty much everything you need to know about distributed energy resources and how they operate and what they are. What we're really looking at here are resources that are behind the consumer's meter, which include not only what Vincent was talking about as active efficiency or timing the use of energy, timing the intensity of that energy use, and timing it in a way that coordinates with the grid in an effective way to ensure reliability, to reduce the use of fossil fuels on that grid by reducing peaks, and to do other things to flatten out the curve, in essence, that causes us to use non-renewable resources, all the way from that to resources that are more active, like battery storage that many consumers are putting behind their meter today. Uh, I have two Tesla power walls in my garage, for example, right now, and I use that to uh, support, uh, you know, my electric vehicle and use it ultimately to uh, ensure the reliability of my microgrid, my house, when the power is off in the, in the neighborhood. But it also can be used as a grid resource. And other resources like rooftop solar, uh, other um, generation, co-generation in industrial commercial facilities, all of these resources combined together can ultimately effectively be a substitute for uh, traditional uh, power plants, thermal uh, fossil fuel fired power plants, and ultimately can provide the full level of resources that are currently traded in that wholesale market that I talked about that FERC oversees. Those include energy, capacity, and ancillary services like uh, frequency response, spinning non-spinning reserve, whole array of ramping services, a whole array of services that are needed to maintain the grid, to operate the grid, to ensure that that grid can integrate larger and larger amounts of renewables into the system. And this is where Order 2222 comes into play. FERC, as it turns out, has jurisdiction and authority not only for resources in front of the grid, that is transmission systems and of high voltage and the generators that interconnect to those systems and, and participate in those markets, but to the extent that consumers choose to participate in the markets as well with their behind the meter resources, that is active um, uh, and passive efficiency, um, uh, battery storage, distributed generation, uh, and other resources that they can aggregate together, FERC has been found under the courts, under a number of court rulings, to have jurisdiction with respect to those resources and to have jurisdiction over the aggregation of those resources and the sale of those resources into the grid, which is a tremendous asset, gigawatts and gigawatts of, a, of an asset that we have in everything from Nest thermostats to Tesla batteries to you, you name it, um, any kind of control that can control a consumer load ultimately can provide services into the grid. At the same time, it's providing comfort and safety and reliability to the consumers behind the meter. So the idea under order 2222, which was a evolution from prior FERC orders, a prior FERC order that was, uh, when I was at FERC uh, back in, in 2010, uh, we issued an order, a FERC order 745, related to demand response, uh, active energy efficiency at the time that basically said that if you reduce a megawatt hour, um, <clears throat> on the grid by reducing load. It should be paid the same amount as a generator who produces a megawatt hour that was upheld by the US Supreme Court. That order then evolved into order 2222, which was passed uh, just last year by FERC that ultimately requires um, the, the uh, allowance for the aggregation of all these resources into any one of those markets that I showed you, all those those uh, active independent wholesale markets that FERC oversees now. Um, order 2222 requires that those markets <coughs> ensure that there are 
structures in place that will allow for consumers and aggregators of consumers to be able to participate in those markets and, and effectively uh, put together uh, what could be considered virtual power plants to provide capacity energy ancillary services into those markets. So I, I'd suggest that this order, which is, is going forward now, all of these ISOs, the independent system operators, currently are developing uh, compliance plans for the orders for order 2222. Uh, that was issued by FERC to submit back to FERC to show that they are going to comply and they're going to allow these different resources to bid into these markets and, and, and receive revenues from those markets. And those revenues will be paid back to consumers to offset the costs of installing these things like batteries and controls for loads and, and rooftop solar and other things. That ultimately those compliance plans will be filed over the next year or so. And we'll be moving forward with a vast new resource in this country that I believe is absolutely essential for us to decarbonize the grid and ensure that we want, that we get to that that low carbon no, uh, zero carbon future that we want to. And I would say, uh, just in closing, that uh, not only will this be coming forward, but we could expand the possibility significantly further if we can also institute wholesale independent markets throughout the Western United States and in the Southeast as well. So I think it's essential for people to support that move. Uh, there have been uh, opposition efforts already put up by uh, the utility companies in the Southeast who don't want uh, their monopolies broken up, don't want uh, consumers to have uh, lower cost, cleaner energy. Uh, and they've already stood up uh, certain uh, websites uh, putting up all kinds of false information about independent system operators that, that FERC oversees. Uh, you know, pe people have to oppose these efforts because if they don't, we're not gonna get to the low carbon grid we need. So with that, uh, thank you, Sarah, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful, thank you all so much. Um, we only have a few minutes, unfortunately, for Q and A. Um, and I know that there are a lot of folks who have chimed in, so I'm going to do my best to ask a couple of questions. Um, and sorry, I'm having to read these for the first time because I just stopped sharing my uh, screen here. Um, actually, I think uh, the, the questions asked are going to lead us. We have two minutes, so <laughs> so I think in the two minutes we have, um, I would love to hear from you all, maybe just a quick round robin. Um, advice to state policymakers and or federal policymakers, you can choose, uh, who are interested in better understanding what they can do to really move, you know, efficiency, electrification, and decarbonization forward. Um, you know, what's the highest priority right now? What's what's the key takeaway? And knowing that policymakers tend to speak in three bullets or less. I'll ask you to do it in three bullets or less. Rachel, I'll, I will start with you. Thank you. So in three bullets or less, uh, I think our ask for federal policymakers and state policymakers are threefold. One is funding. We need a massive stream of funding to help all people have healthier, safer homes that have zero emissions. Um, so prioritize funding going to low income, but really we need funding to help everyone with this energy transition, which is ultimately going to save Americans money and create new jobs. Two, we need better building codes. We need building codes that are encouraging a shift off of fossil appliances to clean energy and that are interactive with the grid. Those going to cut emissions, improve indoor air quality, and improve outdoor air quality. Um, and lower energy bills. And then, then the third thing is we need stronger standards on our appliances. Uh, RMI and the Harvard, Harvard just released a study showing dramatic health impacts from burning fossil fuels in our homes and buildings. I can put that study in the chat. We need stronger standards from the EPA and other agencies so we're not installing appliances in our homes and buildings that are basically like small power plants polluting in our homes. So standards on housing, I mean standards on appliances, building standards and funding. Wonderful, uh, Vincent. No, absolutely. I, I, I'll probably only say a couple of things. One is strategies to ensure universal access. And I think that I touched on a lot of that. And so I won't repeat that. And essentially what that is, is that's ensuring that we're able to get energy efficiency into all homes, regardless of income level. And the, and the other piece I would say, particularly as we think in terms of electrification, that we're ensuring that we're also reducing the energy burden. 
Um, heard a gentleman speak the other day from British of Columbia. He said, right now, the, net, the cost of natural gas in BC is extremely low. And so, and so one of the challenges that they're, that they're actually having as they're moving towards electrification is that they're actually um, coming up against what might be an increase in energy costs. And so, and so certainly that's a strategy. Rachel, you touched on this. As we, as we think about um, transitions in energy, that we identify ways to ensure that we are not increasing, but actually lowering that energy burden. Wonderful. Thank you. John, you're the last and final word on this topic. Sarah, I, I, I've got three things. Okay, markets, go for it. <laughs> markets, markets, markets. Ultimately, FERC has to expand those wholesale independent markets if they want to lower costs for consumers, integrate higher levels of renewables into the system and make the system work more efficiently and more reliably. So ultimately, FERC has to do that. And I'd say that to the FERC regulators, they should move towards expanding those markets and ensuring that integration can happen. And then I would say to state regulators, they should support FERC in doing that and should not listen to the false narratives that are being put up there about why these markets shouldn't be expanded. Awesome. Well, leave it to the policy folks to be able to concisely convey good sound bites and really relevant information on this very diverse topic. Um, I'm being reminded to um, take the survey to rate this session. I apologize for my coughing fit. I could not access my screen to mute myself. So sorry about that, folks. Um, but that's something on the hop in and you guys may want to uh, you guys might want to fix for the next Verge Electrify. Otherwise, really great conversation. Really wish we had more time. Um, but thank you, John. Thank you, Vincent. And thank you, Rachel. And hope you all uh, have a wonderful rest of the conference. And there's the correct link Sam is posting. So thanks, everybody. Thank and thank thanks, you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. thanks. Bye -bye.